Are you going to put everyone on mute? Um, I can still hear that noise. Yeah, I'll do it as I've asked everyone to mute. If you could mute yourself, I think that's everyone now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, Sarah, you can still hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and um, uh, so my first uh, lecture for the Explorers Club, uh, a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, what I am uh, going to consider uh, today is really why uh, we have these uh, very um, different representations of women than we have from men. And that, that's really something that um, really sparked my interest when, when I began my research. Um, and this is a topic that really underpinned much of my research. I actually began uh, looking at pre-dynastic figurines um, as part of my undergraduate dissertation. Uh, and it's really the, this representation of, of women that, that I've continued to study. Um, but the pre-dynastic representations um, are, are absolutely fascinating because in this time period, we have um, much more freedom uh, of design than we do in later time periods both in terms of morphology, so the shape of the figurines, and in terms of material. Um, and um, by the time we get to about 2600 BC, so Old Kingdom, we start to get uh, quite a standardization in Egyptian art. Uh, but in the pre-dynastic period, we have the, this incredible freedom. Um, so it's why uh, we have these representations of women that I'm interested in um, and what they can possibly tell us about the roles women fulfilled and um, how they were perceived uh, and that the, the, the expectations um, of society um, that uh, we can really use the, these representations to try and unpick. Uh, and there are some really common themes, even though we have great variety in form and material. Um, we often have um, a very schematic representation and an abstracted representation of women that we don't have with the male form. And we have uh, very often an emphasis on their sexual characteristics, uh, particularly their pubic region and their hair. Uh, and that's something that we see through pharaonic history. Um, but it's very interesting that we start to see this here um, in, in the very early um, time period. So our evidence from, uh, from the pre-dynastic predominantly figurines, so three-dimensional representations. Uh, we have a limited amount of two-dimensional representations, um, mainly on pottery, and then we have a few examples on linen, one tomb scene, uh, and a number of images of, of rock art. Um, but if we just consider this in, in the concept um, of the pre-dynastic as a whole, um, what is particularly interesting is that these representations uh, are, are all found in Upper Egypt, uh, from, the um, from the Baradian to the Nagardan culture. Um, and this is when uh, society is evolving and, um, and developing. Um, and it's during this time period that we start to get much richer um, <laughs> grave burials. Um, and it, it, it's fascinating to think that as part of this, we've got these representations of women, because what this tells us is as we're, as we're getting these richer burials, it's telling us that society is, is, is evolving. It, it, it's telling us that we've got trade. Um, it's also an indication that we have um, a stratification. Um, we have... Um, diversification of roles, because if somebody is, is producing beautiful painted pottery, as possibly as part um, of um, a workshop, this means somebody else has to be focusing on food production. Um, so we have to, 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 to see uh, these, um, th these representations as part of, of the, the evolving society. Um, and it, it's fascinating to think that the, these representations of women we, we find here as society as, as is evolving and um, before we have the unification of Egypt at, at about 300, about 3000 BC. So most of our evidence, as I said, 
um, is from Upper Egypt. And in the pre-dynastic period, um, the, um, the, the, the cultures um, take on the name of, of, of places. Uh, so we'll see uh, we have um, a, a culture at um, um, Al Badri um, and we have a culture at Nagarda. But what we need to, to be aware of is that think of these as the epicenter of the culture. But there's a whole series of burial fields here and here associated with both um, um, Badari and Nagada culture. So don't think that only uh, that Nagada objects only come from Nagada. They don't. There's a whole series of, of, of burial sites associated with them. But Nagada and El Badri are the epicentre. Um, and most of our evidence from this time period is funereal. Uh, there is possibly one or two figurines which might have been found in rubbish, um, <coughs> rubbish um, heaps, uh, which then could have been used in a settlement site. But as we'll see, as we move towards unification, um, we start to find a limited number of figurines in votive con um, contexts. So the context changes um, to, to include um, temples, but initially most um, of our figurines um, are found in burials. So this, um, this group of figurines beautifully displayed um, at the, the British Museum. Um, this um, is probably the earliest representations in the round that we have um, anthropomorphically from ancient Egypt. So it, it's, it's fascinating to think that at this early time period, um, the ancient Egyptians took the time and the trouble to carve human representations, to carve or to, or to, to create um, by hand. Um, this, we can't help but feel um, a great uh, a connection with the past when we look at these. Um, and if we just think that these are left by the, uh, the, 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 the ancestors, the friends, the family of the, the, the people who are interred. So it's not just about the deceased, it, it, it's about their relationships with their family, they're left as gifts. Uh, so the, 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 the purpose might be more to do with, with their family than with the actual deceased themselves. What's also worth thinking about is that these figurines are actually quite rare. Um, so that, as I said, that this culture takes on the name of the place at El Badri, uh, and that there's about 3000 graves. These are pit burials. Uh, so they're just dug in the sand. Um, so sorry, it's about 300 um, of these um, burials. Um, and there's only three figurines found at El Badri and five from the Badarian culture. So they're not included in every burial and they're clearly not seem to be essential. Um, the burials that they are including included in are not particularly rich. Uh, they're not particularly remarkable. Uh, so that the figurines um, are a rarity um, at this point in time. Um, the very first systematic study of figurines was carried out by Yucco, um, who was working at UCL um, in 1968. And he carried out a cross-cultural um, study um, of them. Um, and it, it, it is, it, it's really worth trying to place the figurines um, in the context of the society that made them and produced them as as that will give us a better insight into their, their function and their purpose. But if we just have a look at this, uh, this beautiful example, one of my favourite objects in the British Museum, uh, we can see that this has been made um, from ivory. So we can think of this as, as from a tooth um, or from a tusk or of a, a, a dangerous animal. Um, and 
we can see that the head is slightly too large for the body. That, that's quite common at this time period. And the eyes uh, very possibly could have had an inlay, as could have the breasts. Um, but we see that the most startling thing about this object um, is the fact that the pubic region and the breasts are really quite prominent in this. Um, it's highly likely that hair was attached, uh, very, very possibly by um, plant and animal matter, uh, for that just, just hasn't survived. But we can see it is quite a realistic depiction. We've even got these beautiful little lumbar dimples here. Um, so we can imagine this bit being carved and being placed into the pit burial. Um, but if we have a look, at this example from the same burial field, um, we can see we do have um, some characteristics in common. We've again got the breasts and the pubic region, but we've got a very different material. Um, we have got this um, terracotta baked clay. Um, and the shape of the figurine is very different. Um, this hand posture we don't see um, in later figurines. This, this is quite an unusual representation. Um, and then we've got this beautiful statopagus body. Uh, statopagus just means you've got a build up of fat on your bottom. Um, so we can see that this is quite, uh, quite a different form than the ivory figurine, even though we've got some common characteristics. And then if we look at this uh, little, little figure, you know, I was thinking of it as a poor relative here. Um, but fascinating because this figurine was found in a rubbish dump. Um, so this means it, it, this figurine could have been used in life because what we need to remember about these figurines when they are found in a burial, that's their, their, the, the end of their life, so to speak, the end of their life history. But they could have been used in daily life and then placed um, in, the, um, in the burial. But again, we've got this strong emphasis on the, uh, the, the breasts here. And if we look at them in profile, um, I think we can see some common characteristics, but also some variety. And that's what's so fascinating about this time period. So this tells us that these are very probably made um, by individual artisans. We don't have workshops now because we've got this wonderful variety. Um, so we also, at this uh, very early time period, have um, a, a feature that, that I am absolutely fascinated with, and that's the decoration of the female body. Because here we can see this figurine um, has markings on the back. Uh, now these could be indicating um, tattooing or scarification, or they could just be a decorative motif. Um, but again, the pubic region is actually highly emphasized here. And this figurine is wearing, uh, is depicted with a, a, a small beaded necklace. So we do have a, a great decoration of the body. And we can see we have uh, very much a schematic form uh, with the legs taking a peg shape, uh, which would allow the figurine to sit also particularly significant about this example is that the careful placement here it has been placed inside a number of pots so th this is demonstrating to us quite clearly that great care and attention was given with these figurines um, <clears throat> so we can also see we have a lack of attention to the facial features here. Facial features are not the most important form. It, it's quite clearly the sexual characteristics. And we may think that that um, is to do with fertility. They may have been placed in the figurine to tap in to uh, the, the inherent fertility of women, um, which may um, have linked to a concept of rebirth. 
But what we have to be careful of is we've got no text from this time period. Um, and it, that the danger is that we transplant later theories and texts on the earlier material. Um, so we, we just have to be aware that of, of the, the limitations of the evidence from the pre-dynastic. We don't start to get any text. Um, the very earliest is the ivory labels um, from the first dynasty uh, tombs at Abydos. So here, our interpretation is based um, um, <coughs> primarily um, on the, uh, the material culture itself. Uh, now, when we move to the, uh, the Nagada period, um, we start to see burials um, uh, really diversifying. Uh, we have much richer burials. There is a continuity to a degree with the material from the um, El Badri time period, um, but we just see a great diversification. Um, and this is a fantastic figurine in the Petrie Museum. And hopefully we can see the continuation of that with the um, El Badri material because we have this fantastic motif um, incised on the back of this figurine. Um, and although it is fragmentary, we can see the pubic region would have been incised here. And of course, we've got the breasts. Um, and again, we've got no facial features. Um, this is one of my favorite figurines. It reminds me very much of the Jean Paul Gaultier um, perfume bottles. And it's that continuity with the past uh, that we can't help feeling when we look at anthropomorphic representations. Um, and this figurine is actually uh, quite famous. She went on tour. Uh, so she went to the Pompadour Center in 2014 uh, to take part in their ex um, exhibition called Simple Shapes. Uh, and that exhibition was indeed uh, looking at how the likes um, of um, Barbara Hepworth and Henry Moore, how they were influenced by, uh, by these figurines. Um, and I think if we saw this figurine um, in, um, in a gallery, um, we would have no trouble thinking that, that, this, that this was a modern figurine. Uh, we could imagine that this be, being a work um, of Picasso. Uh, and it, it really is that, that continuity that I find fascinating with these figurines. But the Nagada one period um, is where we find most of the, these female figurines. Um, and we just have such an amazing diversification. Um, we often have the diamond shape uh, and we can see these two figurines. Uh, they are of a very robust form. Uh, we can imagine their legs are tucked under them. Uh, they um, they have remnants of red paint on them. Um, and again, we have the, the emphasis on the sexual characteristics. Uh, but clearly, the, these are made to be, to be placed um, on the ground. Uh, again, in non-remarkable burials, in the sense that they are not particularly the burial of, of um, a leader um, or a particular, a particular elite. But if we look at the figurine in detail, it's fascinating. Uh, we can start to see that there is some, some possible um, decoration on the figurine, and we'll see more of that later. We can see these stripes here and it has been suggested that these uh, may actually have been indicating a beard. Uh, if so, that, that would have been um, a, 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 an in incredibly interesting uh, and androgynous figurine. Um, there's actually only one figurine that I have, have encountered in, in my studies that, that does include both sexual characteristics, and that's a, a middle kingdom a Middle Kingdom uh, figurine um, from Ed Fu that's at uh, World Museum um, Liverpool. So it, this would be um, highly unusual. But the, the beard is an interesting concept because 
we have very few figurines of, of men from this time period. We do have them. Um, and they tend to emphasize the beard. Um, the beard, of course, is a secondary sexual characteristic. Um, and we can see it as associated um, with maturity. Um, but the beard also, of course, later becomes associated with, uh, with status, with, with social and political status, very much linked to, to, to kingship and the divine. Um, we don't um, see the male figurines emphasizing their sexual characteristics in the same way as we do um, the female. And they are far fewer in number. But I, I wouldn't want you to think that there are no male representations at this time period. There are, but there just is a predominance of female representations. And if we just look at this display from the Ashmolean, uh, we can see the great variety um, of form. Um, we have most figurines are what we can think of as abbreviated, uh, and many of them take this, this diamond shape. The realistic figurines need most um, of their, 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 their body, so to speak, um, for us to, to, to think of them in that manner. So it's this schematic representation that is important. And think of it as shorthand. The Egyptians emphasize the aspects of the figurine which are most important. Um, and there is a fantastic burial um, at Nagada rec recorded um, by Petrie and Cabell. Um, and we can just see from their, uh, their uh, sketch that the burial is incredibly elite. We, we have um, a whole array of vases. Uh, we, we have um, a pallet. Um, the burial is actually very interesting because Petrie believed that the, 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 the bones had been dismembered uh, and then scattered around the burial. Uh, then sand had been placed on top. Then there was the very careful placement um, of the objects, including a series of figurines here. Uh, this dismemberment does happen at this time period. Um, it, it is something which doesn't continue in pharaonic history. Uh, but for our purposes, what we're interested in is this group of ivory figurines, which have been carefully placed here, um, <clears throat> very properly um, standing. And this is why we have this beautiful peg figurine here. Um, and we can see they have um, a basket or a bowl on their head. Um, of course, we've no way of knowing for sure if these are female. However, I believe they are due to their um, hip to waist ratio uh, and also uh, the, the, the decoration of the body. We can possibly think of this as suggesting a skirt, uh, particularly when we look at um, other examples. Uh, so there is a complete example in the Ashmolean. So this concept of a basket on a head is incredibly interesting. Uh, is this suggesting that women are bringing sustenance? Or are, they, are they bringing food and drink to the deceased? Um, as I said, we've got no texts uh, and all, all we can do is look at the objects. Uh, we have other examples um, in different uh, material uh, without, um, uh, with, without uh, the, uh, the, the decoration um, of the ivory examples, which also suggest uh, the figurines are, are possibly bringing um, food or drink. Um, and these examples um, are inserted into what what could be suggesting a boat-like um, image. Um, but once again, if we think of our shorthand, we've got the breasts and possibly um, food and drink here. Uh, so we can start to see um, how these um, figurines are, are suggestive um, of the associations um, of women. And if we just think, um, 
in the old kingdom we start to have these representations of the known deities and these are our females um, who are depicted carrying food and drink for the tomb owner as i said we have to be careful about using later evidence um, but um, we, we as long as we are aware of the limitations of the material uh, we can consider this this is a later figurine uh, from Deir al Medina but if we just look at the indentation here we've got this modus headdress and then an indentation and this isn't really apparent until you actually handle this figurine and um, so we, we, we've got this concept of women as carriers um, and if we think of the uh, the, the, the beautiful um, images from the tomb of Meketra of, of, of the, 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 the two um, very probably um, goddesses um, symbolizing Isis and Nephthys bringing food and drink um, to Meketra. But it's interesting that we have these very early representations. And if we just have a little look um, at this beautiful beaker, um, badly damaged, but it, it is still um, very suggestive um, of the, uh, the, the, the function of these figurines. We can see the breasts have been molded here. So perhaps uh, this beaker uh, was used to hold milk, perhaps mother's milk. Um, in later time periods, um, in the, the, the New Kingdom, for example, there are vessels which take the, the, the form of, um, of a breastfeeding uh, woman, um, and it suggested that they were used to hold milk. Um, and there are many um, prayers um, and evocations from later time periods, which talk about the, uh, the, the, the power um, of the, the milk um, of, um, of, a, um, of a woman, particularly uh, who has given birth to a male child. But this beaker, it's possible that anything that you place in this beaker will take on the sustenance um, of a mother's milk, as that the, the Egyptians um, very often use what we might think of a, a, as contagious magic, the power, uh, the power of touch. Uh, so if we're carrying on with um, our um, consideration of the, the, the development um, of these representations, uh, when we get to Nagada 2, um, we start to see that the figurines uh, decline and we see more images on painted pottery. Um, but the, it, the, the figurines we do have, um, we again, um, we see a link with the images we have seen and we start to see some, uh, some innovation. Um, this is a fantastic um, example. Um, Petrie records it in his Nagada and Balis publication. Um, but he doesn't say where he found it on the site. Most um, of his examples, he gives us the burial. Um, but he doesn't with this. So this suggests he bought it. Um, but it's highly probable that this has been stolen from the site and Petrie buys it back because that is common practice, unfortunately, at this time period. Um, and if we look at this example here, which does have um, a burial number, we see similar motifs. So I think we can be safe in saying that, that this um, is, um, is from, um, from Nagada, um, although it doesn't have a burial number. Um, and we can see the link with the previous figurines because we have, again, this decoration of the body. Um, and it, it, it's so, uh, I think that this really has to tell us how important um, these representations of the female form are. Um, and we have plant motifs um, and we have animal motifs. Uh, and this is something that, that we see uh, on a number of figurines from this time period. And again, we've got the, the, the legs. Uh, 
they are in the peg shape, but we do have um, a differentiation here. Uh, and we've got this beautiful, um, or it, it, it's often called a salute. We've got the, the, the arms raised, possibly in, um, in prayer and um, in praise and um, in jubilation. And this, of course, is one of the most famous figurines from this time period uh, that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Um, it's quite unusual in the sense that the peg um, is painted white. So we can imagine that this is um, evoking a skirt. We can think of this, uh, this figurine as dressed. If we're thinking about continuity, we've got this beautiful statopagus form here. Um, and we've got the, these arms um, reaching up to the sky. We've got no facial features. Um, but when we see these figurines with no facial features, we have to remember that this is intentional. And um, if the artisans wish to create facial features, they would have. If we think back to the earliest figurine we looked at, the ivory figurine, the facial features were individualized. And here we've got the, uh, the digits individualized. So the facial features aren't included because they're not, not the most important thing. Um, and we've got the, the pendulous breasts and the up, uh, the up stretched arms here. Um, this concept of the upraised arms, uh, there, there is at least 38 examples of the, these, the, this type of figurine, but only eight um, actually have um, a, a contact, oh, sorry, only six actually have um, a context. Um, and again, th this figurine uh, was found um, in um, a, a, a not particularly uh, uh, remarkable tomb, two clay vessels, a dish, uh, a fishtail knife, and a Nubian bowl. Um, if we think about the, the morphology of this shape, um, we can look at uh, the pyramid text, which is the earliest religious text, but that's fifth dynasty, about 2800 BC. Uh, we do have the reference to newt of long hair and pendulous breast, has given her arms toward you. Uh, when she shoulders you to the sky, she cannot drop you. So we've got this concept of the, these upraised arms possibly um, lifting the deceased to the sky. If we imagine this figurine placed in the burial, in the ground, we've got this link between the deceased and the sky. We've got this link uh, between the living um, and, and the, the dead. Um, and we do have the, the, the shape of the upraised arms in later um, iconography, of course, resembles the concept of the car, which is the life force, the, the, the essence of a person. If we think of the car as the, the difference between being living and being dead, that spark of electricity. So we've got these arms which are reaching upwards, possibly evoking the car, possibly evoking a deity who later becomes Newt because we can't talk about Newt now. And it's the same with the car. Um, the concept of the car might be there, that this concept of the life force and the essence, but we've got no texts, but that doesn't mean that the concept isn't there. Um, that, that this linking between generations. Um, but in, in, the, um, in the same burial, uh, we have another example, which is not as well preserved uh, and it is, isn't um, as uh, published as often. Um, the figurine was found by a French scholar, de Morgan. De Morgan is a very bad man because he does not publish his excavation report fully. Uh, and it's only when Needler 
uh, later reviews the, this evidence that we act actually start to have um, any publications that we can look at. But we can see this very stylized and very evocative um, shape here. And in the same burial um, field, um, we, we have one burial uh, which has um, 16 fragmentary figurines. Um, and we can see uh, some of them have upraised arms, not all of them. Um, the multiple burials, um, sorry, the, the multiple uh, figurines is incredibly interesting. One isn't enough. We need a whole troop of these figurines. And this is something we see in later time periods. In the Middle Kingdom, the, um, the, the, the so-called paddle dolls um, are often buried in, buried in multiples. So it's very interesting to see that, that this, uh, this continuity. Um, and the 16 fragmentary figurines are also found um, with 16 pots. So is each figurine representing um, a mourner, a dancer, and they are also given a pot? Um, it, it is um, fascinating to think, uh, do these represent uh, female mourners at the, um, at the burial? Uh, do they represent dancers um, at the burial? And if we look at the, uh, the beautiful example um, that's uh, in Brooklyn Museum, we can see that it's highly likely that hair was also attached to this figurine, uh, very probably with plant uh, or animal matter. Um, much has been written about uh, this figurine. Um, it has been suggested um, that, that they are very um, evocative um, of, um, of, of dances and it has been um, cross-culturally, it's been suggested that these are similar to dances which um, actually took place um, by the, the Dinka and the newer tribe. Um, and these dances um, are very um, much associated with bulls and with cows. Um, but we have, we have to uh, be aware that <clears throat> to fully understand the figurines, we need to appreciate them in the context of Egyptian society, ancient Egyptian society. But we can look um, for cross-cultural examples to aid our understanding. And if we just think of the image on the Nama palette, uh, we have the, this uh, fantastic representation, which is very probably of the goddess Bat. Um, and we can see she is taking this bovine form and we have this beautiful uh, representation with the upraised horns. And if we think Bat, um, Bat, it, it is uh, suggested maybe the female form um, of bar. Um, and if we think of the, the bar um, as another aspect of the, the person in ancient Egypt, we've got the car, the life force, the essence. And then we have the bar, which we can think of as your individuality. That's how I think of it. We, we've all got a bar, a life force and an essence. Um, so we've all got a car, a life force and an essence, uh, but your bar is what makes you, you and me, me. It's your individuality. So if we think these figurines may be evocative of both the car, the life force and the essence with the upraised arms and your individuality, your, your, your bar, and they are placed in the sand, as part of your burial, um, it, it is uh, an incredibly interesting uh, to think of why these were placed in, 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 in the burials and how they relate to, to other aspects of material culture from this time period. 
We also have to remember that the bar, when we get to the New Kingdom, we have the concept of the bar bed. Uh, and the bar bed, it, it um, can leave the tomb, it can uh, receive sustenance, and it can come back. Uh, so we also have the, this link with these figurines um, with birds. And if we look this beautiful image from Abydos, we ha actually have Isis here taking on the role of a kite uh, so that she can be impregnated by Osiris. Um, so we, we have um, multiple um, links um, and associations um, with these figurines. Um, it's been suggested that they, they could have been held um, as instruments, if we think of this figure, th this image hovering above the deceased before they are actually placed in the burial. Of course, we will never know because we do not have any texts from this time period. But clearly, the, these figurines with the peg base are quite robust. You could hold them. Um, the arms um, are incredibly fragile, and we see that because um, many of the arms are snapped. But the bases are here quite robust, possibly to be held and then to be placed um, in, the, um, in the sand. The concept of the upraised arms we do see uh, in other mediums from this time period, and they're not always necessarily associated with women. If we look at this um, Siwa um, vase here, uh, with a beautiful representation of figure with upraised arms. Um, but due to the possible penis sheath, this is much more likely to be a male. Um, <coughs> But we've still got the, this concept of the upraised arms possibly used as part um, of a dance um, or a, um, a, a celebratory ritual. Um, and we've got the size differentiation of the figures here. Now, this is a wonderful image, um, well, a wonderful bars uh, rather, um, found in a burial at Abydos. And we can see we've got a whole circle of women um, <laughs> attached to um, a pot. Now, obviously, it'd be quite difficult to drink anything out of this pot, but you could leave food or drink in this pot and place it in the burial. Um, is this suggestive of women in a circle carrying out a dance? Again, we've got beak-like features because the, the face is not the important thing. Uh, we do have the breast symbolized and we've got the white um, possibly suggestive of a skirt. Um, we have a very limited number of uh, linen uh, representations. Um, <clears throat> now, this is a fantastic example. Uh, this was found with um, a burial and this may have been uh, used um, as a wall hanging. But if we look at these images, we can see we have a series of, we're assuming that they are women due to the similarity um, in other mediums. And we've got holding hands here and then we've got raised arms here. So we've got a variety of arm postures. So is this suggesting uh, that the, 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 the women move their arms through a series of poses as part um, of, this, um, of this dance? We have black here, um, not the white skirts, uh, but there is a degree of similarity. Also depicted um, on um, another um, piece of linen that there are, are two of these uh, linen wall hanging hangings which were found at Gerblaine. Uh, they're now in Turin. Uh, we do see images of the hunt, and that's something we'll see later. This association of representations um, of, of of women, possibly carrying out uh, rituals um, and the hunt. So. 
the decoration of the female body um, continues um, in the Nagada period. Uh, there are about eight figurines which have no context, unfortunately, uh, which do have um, a decorated um, body. Um, and we can see this wonderful example uh, still has it, its hair attached. Um, again, we've got the decoration of the body, jewellery, um, and a whole array um, of um, images which could be suggestive um, of tattooing um, or just decorative motifs. Um, again, we've, we've got a beak-like nose here. Um, and we have a multi multitude of representations, uh, very often animals on the, uh, the reverse of the figurine. If we look at this example from Turin, we have very likely to be sheep, which is um, a common motif we see on painted pottery. Um, so we are seeing the association of animals and very often nilotic motifs with the uh, representations um, of the female form. Um, and this um, is an example um, of one of these Barbary sheep. Uh, this is on a pre-dynastic palette, but we also see them on, in rock art on the Western desert. Um, if we look at this beautiful pot in the Ashmolean, we see that the, the, uh, the, that the sheep is actually surrounded by dogs. These could be hunting dogs. Uh, they are wearing a collar or a bell. Uh, so there is possibly some degree of domestication in association with the dogs and the sheep are being hunted. But the motifs we see on the, the, the um, female figurines we do see on pottery so we have to to debate whether they are decorative motifs um, or they are body art but even if they are, are just decorative motifs it's this association with animals and the nile that it is really quite um, telling now until friedman and antel published their paper about the re-evaluation of uh, two um, mummies in the British Museum. I would have had to say there is no examples of tattooing from the pre-dynastic period. Uh, but since their fantastic article, uh, we do have evidence of tattooing from the pre-dynastic. Um, the male um, example, which we're not looking at, um, is Ginger, who some of you I know will be very familiar with in the British Museum. Um, Friedman and Antoll um, used infrared to look um, at um, two um, mummies, Gablain woman and Gablain man, who is Ginger. Um, and their paper is, is amazing because prior to this, the earliest evidence of tattooing in ancient Egypt was 2000 BC. Uh, and it was on the female um, mummies found at Deir el Bari in association with Montuhotep II's court. But now we have evidence of tattooing from the pre dynastic. Uh, and if we look at Geblain woman, um, she has uh, possibly uh, an instrument, possibly um, a, a clapper, a, a sceptre and she has these S shapes here. Um, due to the fragility of the body, um, it is possible that there are more um, tattoos on this, um, but researchers were obviously very careful in their reanalysis. Uh, so there may be more, um, but these um, are, are, are quite clearly apparent using the new technology. And if we look at uh, an image on, on um, a pre-dynastic pot, we can see similar motifs. We can see possibly somebody holding an instrument and we have these Z shapes. Uh, there's much debate about these Z shapes um, on pottery. Are they birds? Are they smells? Are they sounds? But from our point of view, what it is, is 
most interesting is that there is a similarity of iconography on the deware pottery um, and um, on the actual um, tattoos. Um, and it is the deware pottery where we have most two dimensional representations um, of women. Um, and the, the, the deware pottery is um, much more standardized in comparison to the figurines that we have looked at. So this suggests that at this point in time, this material is where is made in one or two workshops. Um, and then it, 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 is, uh, it is exported up and down the Nile. Uh, but we do see much more standardization in design. Um, and it, it's here that we start to see similar images uh, to the figurines. Um, the the deware pottery um, is, is a fascinating topic. Uh, there are a number of repeat symbols. So the images clearly are meaningful to those that created them and viewed them. We might not understand them fully, but these are not random, random images. Uh, that there is a, a limited number of signs and they clearly mean something. Uh, and this, the images of, of uh, what we read as women are similar to the images that we saw of the figurines with the upraised arms. Uh, there is, it's an interesting um, differentiation between the male and the female. Um, the female images are frontal so that they are looking directly at us. Uh, the male representations are in profile and are very often um, indicating movement. Uh, but the females um, often have upraised arms. So again, we can think of them in a celebratory uh, or a jubilant um, pose or possibly carrying out um, a dance. We also need to be aware that the images that we are going to look at um, depicting the women uh, are actually uh, quite a small representation of the images on the deware pottery. The, the, the images of animals and plants are much more common. Um, the, the female representations are of a much more limited number but obviously they are significant for our consideration of this representations um, of women. And we see the boats, the boats are the main feature. Um, and the, the boats are often in procession. Um, they have a different standard, so we can tell that there are no, a number of boats traveling. It's not just one boat repeated, uh, which is common in Egyptian art, what we oft, oft, often have um, almost like a cartoon uh, narrative. But here we have a procession of boats. Um, and we can see we have this beautiful representation of what we can read as a woman with the, uh, the, the difference to that hip to um, waist ratio and the up raised arms. Uh, she is clearly the most important, uh, uh, most important figure on this boat. We've got two cabins and a series of oars, but we've got no rowers. Uh, whether this boat is, is, is in water or whether it's a mythical boat traveling across the sky, We've also got uh, a female figure here as a spectator. We've got the symbols we can see as mountains and the symbols we can see as water. Um, and we have um, animals. Um, <clears throat> so do we have uh, some sort of ritual action being carried out on this river um, procession? Uh, <laughs> And if we uh, look at the, uh, the, the second boat, we can see we, we have uh, more figurine figures, but no raised arms, but we have a series um, of um, figures who are accompanying the females, uh, very probably men, and they are depicted um, carrying instruments here. Um, <clears throat> 
we can we can make suggestions of what these processions are about are they funerary processions are they religious processions uh, later of course in pharaonic history uh, the gods leave temples and travel um, for festivals um, and here we indeed can see a, a, a female um, inside, uh, we can almost think of this as, um, as a shrine and um, as a naxos here. Um, <clears throat> however, some of these representations um, do suggest um, elements of the hunt. Um, if we look at these images here, this cross hatching is suggesting net. Um, so it is possible that we have these representations of women and um, in association with the hunt. Um, <clears throat> in later time periods, we have the concept of the house of the Achaea, um, and that is a old kingdom institution, um, and that is associated with butchery um, and, um, and dance and funerary um, action, but this, th this is an old kingdom institution. Uh, but is this a forerunner of that? Are we seeing women um, carrying out ritual um, action um, as good luck for the hunt? Um, we, we have representations um, of um, Flamingos, um, ostriches, sometimes we have um, animals associated with the, the, the savannah, uh, in addition to nilotic elements too. But again, we've got these symbols here, uh, suggesting possibly birds or sounds. And then we have beautiful representations. Um, we have what we can probably read as um, male um, actors. We've got the feathers in their hair, very similar to the image we saw on the painted pot earlier, which had the, the, the uh, male with the upraised arms, and they are holding clappers here, uh, or sceptres, um, and we have the female figure with the upraised arms. Um, clearly the female figure um, is the most important representation here, um, as we know the Egyptians um, use size as a status indicator. Beautiful uh, representation of nets. We think of this as the, as the whole series of nets which are, are there as part of the hunt. I just wanted to flag up that we see similar representations that are not associated with the river. So we have got these mountainous representations here, um, but we've still got the, um, the nets. So we've got the concept of the hunt. So the figures with the raised arms are not, um, <coughs> are, are not limited to just being associated with the boat. We do have um, also representations of the mountains. And if we think of the pre-dynastic people um, and the different environments that they will have resided in close to the Nile, um, they'll have gone into the eastern and the western desert and perhaps also gone into uh, the savannah land uh, and the mountains um, for hunting. We do have similar representations um, on rock art, um, but rock art is notoriously difficult to date because, of course, we can have um, later editions. Um, but we can see this motif is clearly very important um, in the pre-dynastic period. Um, and it, it, is, um, it, it is just difficult for us to interpret um, due to the lack of texts. I said to begin with, we did have a limited uh, representation um, of a two scene. We have 
one. Uh, and this, of course, is the very famous um, Hierocompolis Tomb 100. Um, and we can see a whole series of boats. Um, it is generally thought that these um, are um, in a funerary procession. Um, although some scholars suggest the black boat um, is indicating um, a foreigner. Um, <clears throat> but for our purposes, it is the representation of women um, in this that are, are quite important. The painted scene runs along here. Um, <clears throat> the tomb um, was looted in antiquity. Um, and if we look, we can see we have our representations of women here, but they've got outstretched arms as opposed to upraised. Um, but we can see they are wearing uh, what we can think of as a skirt painted white. So similar to the, uh, the so-called dancing figurine, the celebrant. Um, also similar to the um, representations on the linen from Geb Lane. So are we again seeing women associated in some sort of ritual activity associated with um, a funerary procession? We have some wonderful um, images um, in this um, painted tomb, very iconic of later representations. Uh, if we have a look at, at the black and white um, image, it's easier to see. Uh, we've got some smiting scenes um, and we, we've got this concept of control over nature. But I think it, it's really telling that in the, this, uh, the, the, the only painted tomb that we have from this time period, we do have these representations um, of women carrying out this ritual activity. Um, we can see the, the multitude of representations, that the, the images are really on, on the cusp, that they have some representations which are forward thinking, so-called pro proto-dynastic images, and then we have some representations which link back to the Nagada period, and that's what our, um, our ladies are part of, the, the, this representations um, of, a, uh, of an earlier time period. Right, I am aware that I have gone on uh, possibly too long. Um, I will be very quick and just wanted to show you where the figurines lead to. Um, it's very difficult to date figurines to the uh, what we can think of as Nagada III or proto-dynastic period. We have limited representations. Uh, they are found mainly at Hierocompolis and Abydos. And we can see this ivory figurine. Um, what we find now is that the hair is an integral part of the figurine instead of it being something which which is is attached separately and um, it's so important that it, it is it is now um, an, an integral part of the figurine clearly this ivory figurine was made to be attached to something and that's what we start to see now that the material when we start to find them in in a votive context we have the use of ivory. Uh, we have two types, we have the non-elite figurines such as this and then we have elite figurines such as this. Beautiful example, we can see this little lady is wrapped up in a cloak which of course is a forerunner to these sort of images we get in the old kingdom and that's why this evidence is so fascinating from this time period because it it's full of creativity um, and individuality, but some elements um, we see developed in the um, in, in later time periods. Um, and if we just look here, we can see again um, the the importance of the hair um, at the, these two sites, Abydos 
and Hierocompolis. Um, this is the last figurine. Uh, I just wanted to flag up the importance of the image of the mother and the child. This is probably the earliest image we have of a mother and child. Um, and this, of course, becomes incredibly important in later time periods. And if we look, we have the use of this beautiful uh, decorated cloak, which, of course, again, is something we'll see in later time periods to evoke status. And the mother and child, of course, is something which um, becomes very symbolic of Isis and Horus. So with that, I will leave um, our um, lecture this evening and we can have um, questions. That was absolutely brilliant. I didn't, I kind of didn't realise you would get into bar and car um, terrain and I love that and I really um, resonate with a lot of the things that you said about your ideas about the car and the bar and um, there were so many things I've written a load of notes but they're all really scribbled and untidy. Um, well, I think you just have to think about it I mean my point is we can't say it's the bar and the car yeah. because they're, they're not vocalized at this point in yeah. time but that doesn't mean those concepts didn't exist it's yeah. just that later they become formalized as the bar and the car um, but that doesn't mean they didn't exist earlier, but we, we, we'll never know. And as long as we're aware that we can't we can't pick up those older um, theories and place them on top, I, th I think we, we, we can play about with them, definitely. Yeah, I think that um, it really reminded me of a lot of the representations of the female form in Cycladic and Minoan art, and they are shown with their hands raised like this all of the time as well. Well, Sarah, it's so funny you should say that. Um, my undergraduate degree was half Egyptology and half archaeology. And my dissertation was inspired not by Egyptology, but by the Cycladic figurines. Because I'd done, I, I, in my archaeology, I, um, I'd, I, I'd done um, a, a module on, on, on the, the Cyclades. And I absolutely fell in love with the Cycladic figurines. And then that led me to research the pre-dynastic figurines for Egypt. Mm. So, yeah that there is so many similarities uh, and, and they in themselves are a fascinating topic. Yeah, there was a there was one figure as well that I saw. It was actually a male figurine that looked very, very similar to the Anatolian Urfa man mm -hmm. um, with the kind of um, chevron uh, collar yeah. around him and really similar uh, features. But um, I'm interested in this idea because a lot of these figurines often get lumped in with an idea of them being fertility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, p people just use that as, as a blank, a blanket. Um, you know, oh, that their, their, their fertility figurines, um, and I think you know we 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 have to acknowledge that that often the, the sexual characteristics of of women are emphasised: the pubic region and and the breasts. Um, but the, the, there's so much more to, to, to them that, than that. I mean, the ones with the indentations on the head could, could be associated with, with food and drink. Um, Do you think those figures are then kind of proto Shabti dolls? This idea that you they, 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 they very they, they very much could be, particularly when you when, when we think of um, the the Middle Kingdom figurines. Um, I, I'm thinking of the, the the two very very famous figurines from Maquette to uh, that they have the offerings on, on, on their head um, and that they're bringing food and drink. Um, so yes, that, that, that they could be, it's that essence of, um, of, of abundance um, and that might be linked to fertility. When we think of the, the, the beaker with the breasts and you know, the, the life-giving essence of women. Um, but I, I think, I think we do them a great uh, sort of disservice if we just say, oh, the fertility figurines and that. Yeah. That's I've it. kind of come to think of those early figurines as being more representative of the great ancestress, you know, this idea that uh, the female form does provide life. So it isn't necessarily a kind of classic fertility figure, but, you know, a lot of the early cultures worshipped a female as the yeah. creator of the universe and, um, uh, a lot of them were uh, solar goddesses as well. I think in Manoa it was a solar goddess. 
if we think we later have uh well we have so many representations of the goddess newt and she, she has it yeah. she has her arms raised and she's receiving the deceased and i mean the later time period to think of the coffins are often inside the coffin there'll be a representation of newt who is facing you frontally with her arms raised so and she you was, often have geb underneath you as well yeah. so like in between the two of them so she's receiving you um so it, the, the figurines with the upraised arms are, are absolutely fascinating and, and there are so many things to, 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 to read into them, particularly if you can, the, 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 the peg, you can place them in the sand yeah. and they're reaching upwards and yeah. they're, they're quite substantial. Yeah. The other thing that I've never heard anyone talk about, and I actually wrote about the idea myself, was this idea of those upraised arms representing the bull horns. Yeah. Because I really thought that looking at Manoa, and I think that you can um, cross-reference that symbol of um, the bull horns, which is ever present in Manoa, yeah. uh, being echoed by the shape of the arms. And in that way, the car as well is almost this like adoring posture where yeah. you're projecting your car and your life essence into the heavens somehow. It feels like a very yeah. natural posture of adoration and worship. It, it does, doesn't it? Um, yeah, the the, um, the the article, it's a, a Joan Relk who, who wrote about the pre-dynastic dancing figurine uh, and, and she uh, she goes back to, to early anthropologist theories um, of, of the, these various dancers and how, how the boys evoke the bull, the, 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 the spreading of the bull's horns with their upraised arms and that the, the, the women are evoking the cows. Mm. Um, so yeah, absolutely fascinating. Uh, Rene asks, um, were women seen as containers of this abundance and, and therefore sort of delivering them in those grave goods? Well, I mean, obviously we, we, we've got we've got no text, so all, all we can go on is the images. But what throughout pharaonic history, uh, one, one of the ways that women are represented that is completely different than men it, is, is as carriers. If we think of the sky goddess Newt, we see see the sun traveling through her body it, it remains the same it, it, it she, she swallows the sun she gives and then she gives birth to it um so we do have this concept of women as carriers that that we don't have and geb i mean obviously i know we're talking about later time periods but geb um and um, geb is, is the, the creative essence and men if, if we think we, we, we fertility lies with men in that sense but women very much are carriers. Um, they don't have that that sort of spark of fertility because that lies with men. Um, Do you think that was a concept familiar to very, very ancient people always? Because there are some anthropologists who think that maybe yeah. very ancient people actually didn't recognize or make that connection between um, uh, insemination and yeah. pregnancy and birth nine months later. It's very difficult to tell when, when, when we've got no when, when when we've got no texts. The the um, very ro robust Nagada figurines. I mean, they, they look like the Venus figurines, that the, the, the ones with the big thighs that that, that are sitting. Um, but we don't we don't see them later. That they that, that they they very much trail out. Um, mm. I don't know. I don't know is the answer to that. It, it is. Hard, it's hard to. Um, it's hard to tell. What is interesting is that we don't have an overriding series of representations of men. Wow. Um, you know, we female figurines carry on to the to the Greco Roman period. We, we have different styles and and and, and, and different forms. But male figurines, we don't have the, the, the same. And there's so, no like phallic symbols at the, at the same time period that you find. No, no. Even at later time periods, there are very few phallic representations. When we've got the god Min, um, but um, from the pre-dynastic, the, the, there's a few figurines with penis sheaths. Um, 
but we, we just don't have the, the, the same um, emphasis on the sexual characteristics mm -hmm. uh, as we do with, 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 with the female form at all. Mm. Um, let's see what's, Maria asks, why do you think that the female faces are represented with this bird shaped face? Beak. The beak's very interesting. Um, that that might link into this concept of um, that is later developed uh, as the bar, but obviously it's not at the bar at that moment. That the bird, of course, that the the, the the most significant thing about the bird is the concept of movement. So you 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 you've got this this ability to uh, and to fly to the sky. So it may be that women are seen as this intermediary because. From the earliest time periods, the gods are seen as residing in the sky. So perhaps that, that, that's why the, the, the bird is so important as it's seen as, as this, um, this intermediary between the living and the dead. Yeah, I've had um, uh, a meeting previously with uh, Kasia Zupikowski. Oh, yes. Kalka, and she was talking about um, the experience of sleep paralysis and nightmares. And I know in some books, I've read, I can't, who was it? It was um, Stefan Rossini, maybe, who was um, putting forward the idea that ancient Egyptian people could potentially have experienced um, uh, near death experiences or something that made them feel like their soul was actually leaving their body that would have inspired some of those ideas. Yeah. Mm. I mean, even things like um, very intense dreams where you feel that you're seeing outside of your body could have influenced that idea of being able to, as a spirit, leave and, and fly off into the sky. Mm. Mm. I mean, our, our, early, our earliest representations of, of gods it is very probably um, a falcon, um, which, which becomes um, Horus or Ra, depending on how, how we, we, we view it. But it is likely that the earliest representation of, of a deity um, it, it is a falcon. So it's clear that that association with, with birds and the divine, and it because of the flight concept. Um, Do you think there is a switch from looking at, um, looking at the female as being the um, general, generative force behind life to seeing the sun as being male? The sun, yeah, I mean, we, we, we don't, um, when, when we get, to, I mean, our, our earliest text, the, early, the earliest religious text we can talk about is the pyramid text. Um, and we've got Ra um, as, a, we, when we read the sun, we can read Ra. Um, and we, we do Newt plays an important role in the um, in the pyramid texts, um, and, and she, she she is sometimes referred to as the, as the mother of the gods. Mm. Um, but when when that actually when, when that shift actually occurred it, it is is difficult to say. If we think the pyramid texts are probably written by the the, the priests of Heliopolis. Um, and they are going to focus on on, on the, the, the solar gods. Um. Yeah, um, there's, I'm just looking at my notes and they're so scruffy, I can hardly make out what any of them say. I was getting really excited around <laughs> um, a lot of the stuff that you brought up. So are the ivory figurines hippo ivory? Or you don't know what, we don't know what ivory they are. Yes, yes, they are the hippo, hippo ivory. And of course, at later points in time, um, the, the Egyptians use hippo ivory to make the beautiful wands, which are, are, are protect, protectors of women and children. So the, the ivory itself will be very important, I, I think, to the Egyptians, because it, it's going it's to contain that the power and the essence um, of the hippo, one of the most dangerous creatures that the Egyptians will, will have faced. Uh, and hippos are notorious, uh, female hippos, for, for protecting their young. So that the, the material itself might have had a, ha, had a protective essence in it. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. I think I've asked um, this previously on other talks, but about the, the, the car symbol and the word for bull is car as well. Is that right? 
Um, yes, I think so. Yes. So is there something in the ball that also represents this like vital potent force that can be expressed through the car symbol? You see, what it makes me think of, again, what we're now projecting into later time periods, but if we think of the opening of the mouth ceremony, when the, the priest is instructed to cut off the foreleg of a calf, yeah. instructed to run while it's twitching, and then to present that to, to, the, to the mummy. So I think, uh, I think of that uh, as linked to this because it's that life force, that energy that seemed to be um, it, it, in the opening of that ceremony, it's, it's in the calf. So I, I think it's the whole bovine essence, mm. but it, from, from very early time periods, um, um, bulls and cows are, are worshipped. Um, if you think of the, the burials, the, 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 royal, the, the non-royal burials at Saqqara, uh, the, the, there's one, I can't remember the, what, what, what number the burial is, but it has a whole array of bull's horns out, outside. It's got the palace facade and then it's got a whole array of bull's horns. So clearly from the earliest time periods that this life force, that this essence, what was linked uh, with the bovine. But if we think of it as, a, a, as uh, it, 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 cows and bulls will have been providing um, so much in your in your normal life if you think of meat and milk and hide so it, it's not really that surprising that that, that they would take on the, these life-giving qualities and also I suppose like the intense sexual potency of a bull as well would be something yeah. very visually apparent in way more of a dramatic uh, yeah. than a, an, a man and uh, isn't the car also represented with a, a penis in, in one of the pharaoh's names? It's like three penises, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, oh, it might. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, to be honest, but, but it, 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 would, it wouldn't surprise me um, it, you know, it, if it was. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the concept of, of, of the car and, and the bar, I, I think we, we can't imagine that they just materialise yeah. Uh, out of nowhere from ancient Egypt. It, it's incredibly complex thought process that, that, that the way they see that the, the, the multifaceted nature of the person. Um, and I think in many respects that that's very proper with the figurines. You could use them in life. We end up with them in, in the burial, but that doesn't mean that they weren't used in, in life. Um, and they very well might, might have had multiple functions. Um, and then they, they are then interred, and so that they, they have a, a, a funerary function. Um, uh, does anyone else have any other questions? I feel like I'm hogging all the questions. You're very welcome to unmute yourself and ask Joe your own question. Let's see if I can make any more sense out of my notes. Look at the state. Look at the state of them. <laughs> Handwriting is atrocious, you know, because we type everything now. If I have to write anything, it, it's absolutely awful. Oh, one of the things I did notice is there's that kind of Potnia uh, Theron image of the symmetrical scene, which in the earliest times was always a goddess um, uh, overpowering the animals, and then in later times became a male figure uh, overpowering the animals. And then you get, you get the kind of morphing into the, the representation of the female on the throne, and that then turns into Orset or Isis as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was the, 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 the mistress of animals where, where you, you've, you've got yeah, the... Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And what's yeah. interesting with those, those uh, figures that you're showing us was that they'd almost incorporated the mistress of animals, the Potnia Theron uh, iconography onto the skin of the person. So she was embodying that energy. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the tattooed mummies are, are just fascinating because until um, Friedman and Antol had, had published their paper, it was only female uh, mummies that had any body art. Um, mm -hmm. But then, of course, that they discover that there is tattooing on ginger. Um, and this is a relatively new technique, this in, in infrared. Um, 
and Anne Austin's been doing work on mummies from Dale yeah. Medina. We're going to have Anne Austin on. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, but this means that that there might actually be a whole array of tattooed um, evidence that we've just not been able to see. Uh, so that, that there could be, a, you know, a whole array of revelations um, to come. Um, Yeah, that was brilliant. Um, do you think one of the things that came to my mind with the, especially the, I think it was the Nakar de Pots, was perhaps some representation of a sacred marriage because the female figure looks very prominent and the man looks a bit pathetic, stick manny like beside him. I mean, the, the, the imagery on the pots, the, the female figure it, it is without a doubt taking precedence. Um, and, and, you know, whether she is a priestess um, or whether it's uh, associated with, whether it's just, uh, associated with funerary rituals or with the hunt, uh, but the, the, it's the female, that, that's the, the, the bigger person, more representations. Um, so it, it's, de it's definitely showing that the importance um, of the female. When mm. we get to the old kingdom, um, there are very few female figurines. Um, we, we get a proliferation again in the, in the Middle Kingdom. We, 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 we get huge variety in material and form, but we never get the diversity that we get here. Mm. The, 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 because of course, we start to get um, workshops, where, whereas now uh, at this point in time, we've we, we probably got individual artisans. And that's why the pottery is more, um, standardized but because it's been made in a workshop um so we, we as society evolves to a degree we lose some, some of that um diversity and that's why i love the pre-dynastic period yeah, yeah. i mean that you had some fantastic images there i hadn't seen a lot of those images and the art on those pots especially really brought to my mind this idea of a kind of consort yeah um king that you you know the priestess the high priestess would um uh ferry out every now and again for a ceremony yeah. and then maybe kill him and move on to the next one <laughs> yeah i mean we, we could the, the the cabins we do see cabins on them boats so uh, it could be a forerunner to um statues le leaving a temple traveling to another temple for festivals mm -hmm. um it's definitely carrying it's definitely depicting some sort of ritual action and it's just that we we don't we can't can't say for sure yeah, the other figures on it as well mostly are female forms represented and they all seem to be in that uh posture as well so that's really interesting yeah it looks like uh it looks like priestesses of some sort yeah it, it looks like like that they're in a a, a very uh, a, a very uh sort of celebratory or a jubilant pose um but I also, I found the image on the linen very interesting because we've got the different arm postures. So it's as if we're being shown that the um, that a series of moves before we get to that jubilation pose. Um, but yet we, we don't get, um, we, we don't get such rich imagery again, um, depicting female act, um, actors. Um, It's interesting this relationship to um, sailing and boats as well, because obviously that's a big issue with the sea people and the Cycladics and with the Minoans as well. The um, the solar goddess was associated with protecting the seafarers and um, bringing them safely home. So I think that that connection between the because I think that the ancient Egyptians weren't necessarily known for the best seafaring abilities. Yeah. No, um, the, the the boats the boats are particularly interesting because we, we, we do have to think that they're not necessarily depicting real boats that, that they, they could be depicting they could be depicting um, boats that are traveling through the sky because of course by the time we get to the um, the, the old kingdom if you think of Khufu's pyramid he, he's got two solar barks which which are made for his travels in the sky and then. When we've got to the new kingdom, we, we've got the concept of the sun god traveling through the 12 hours of the night, and he mm -hmm. does that in, in, in a bark. So we clearly have that, that the concept, a dual concept of the boats that, that do really travel on the Nile, 
and they also travel through the through the sky with with the gods um but the, the boats are the most um the, the most common feature on the on those pots um and as i said that that they even when they depict uh, one or two when they depict multiple boats it's different boats because yeah. there's a standard so we can think of them in a procession yeah. um Yeah, well, I'll, 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 there's someone, uh, I think I've got another question here. Uh, uh, Beth says, fantastic lecture. I'm taking a break from my MA studies and love these pre-dynastic figurines. Also the prehistoric figures from Cyprus and the Aegean. There are female figurines with upraised arms and some with beak-like features in Cyprus. Yeah, the bird, the bird goddess comes in, in in Manoa as well. Back to Egypt, I'm thinking about Nabta Playa and the idea that the first monumental sculpture of a cow appears there. There is a ritual cow burial there too. Do you think that's a representation of a cow? Thanks for making me think again about all of this. Um. Oh, I, I, I'm. <laughs> I'm not. This is what, what what is Beth? What what are you asking? Uh, um, do you think that's a representation of a cow? What uh, what what do I think is a representation of a cow? I'm not actually that familiar with the Nabta player material. Um, is the Nabta player um, an idea of a very early astronomical clock? Yeah, it's quite small. When you see pictures of it, you expect it to be quite large, but it's it's actually quite small. Um, but I, I'm I'm not familiar with the um, sculpture of a cow. Um, Hi, I've un I've unmuted. Can you hear me? Hello. Can hear you. <laughs> Hi. I suddenly realised instead of writing an essay in the chat, perhaps I ought to unmute and say hello. <laughs> yes, yeah. much, nicer, much nicer to say hello. Hello, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, no, when I was uh, studying about the Nabja Player site, um, uh, they, I'm talking, I'm thinking really about the Wendorf um, excavations that were undertaken all that long time ago. And so rather than the astronomical, I'm thinking more about the archaeological, that there are the astronomical as well, but the archaeological where they found the, um, there was a cow burial there that seemed to have been ritually based. Oh. And so what they felt might have been the very f first a monumental sculpture of a cow. Mind you, you have to squint very hard to see if it is a cow. But hey ho, the way that it's that the papers and um, um, all the uh, articles that I read about it uh, seem to be implying that um, this was a time when the, the climate was changing in the um, prehistoric period when you were getting more of a drought situation. So at the time of Nabja Player at its height, um, you were having um, people coming in and they were bringing their cattle with them. And so it was very much a bit like, uh, a bit like the, Masama, the Masai Mara, how, how they're moving around. So they just come in, it was a seasonal site and they would leave their, you know, remains there, and then off they'd go again. Um, and uh, so that's just what I was thinking. And it's always made me wonder if there was such um, a prominence of the cow at Nabta Playa with that burial and with that so-called um, monumental sculpture, is there an essence of an idea there how important the female animal was because they clearly knew how important the um the cow was to, mm -hmm. to keep them alive um because they wouldn't necessarily kill it for meat but um oh. they might use the the meat or you know something uh, not the meat the um the milk but mm. yeah little ideas like that running around you know the head where yeah well i mean that there's the, the the bovine the bull and the cow are clearly incredibly important for yes, yeah, and yeah. even that there's some beautiful flints which are in the shape of of the upright the upraised um horns um 
and we get bat but bat, bat it, it, it is worshipped before hathor um, yeah. Yeah. um then hathor take takes over from bat so we we do clearly have that this that this importance of of the, the the bovine um both the cow and the bull um but i i, I haven't seen the sculpture of the uh the the, the cow at nab to play it to be honest so mm -hmm. i am um, yeah. i have to have a look at it and squint hard and see if i can see the cow you do have to squint i must admit but this is um wendell um yeah. there's a, a book of his about desert days and he tells all about his excavations in the early days about it and of course the articles that he, he's written appears in various archaeological I'll have uh, to have a look. journals is there um a kind of concept about the um, horus being the bar of ra and he is the con he is the kind of companion of hathor or hathor is well Horus, um, you see, we, the, the, there are many forms of Horus, um, and the, 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 the Horus the Elder, yeah. which, which is the falcon god, we're not talking about son, son of Isis and Osiris, so we've got Horus the Elder, who is the falcon god, he, um, he is seen to have Hathor as his consort, but if we think Hathor, the name means the house of Horus, so, so that, that, that is, is, is quite telling. But Horus the Elder, the falcon, uh, is likely to be the earliest deity that's worshipped. Um, and certainly the, um, the earliest cult statue we've got is, is the, 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 the small um, remnant of the, the, um, the falcon from Hierocompolis, which is about fifth or sixth dynasty. But Horus the Elder, his consort is Hathor. So we, we can see, and Hathor doesn't really appear much in the pyramid text because she's not part of all that Heliopolis creation myth. Uh, so it might very well be that, that the earlier religion was Horus as the falcon yeah. and Hathor as this bovine. I, yeah, I was just thinking about maybe it did evolve from Bar and Bat and Bar was the precursor to Horus yeah. potentially and... and that would have been her there's, there's a, a pre-dynastic vase, well, early dynastic vase, which ha has been reconstructed, and it's it's got an image of Bat, um, and it, it, it's got her name in hieroglyphs, so we know for sure it's Bat. And if if we if we think of, if we just think of of, of you know it, it's the, the T is is what makes it feminine, so it's that concept of bar it, yeah. it is it, it is inherent in Bat, and mm -hmm. she. One of the first deities we 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 see yeah. on any kind of um, if we think of the Nama palette as a, as a sort of socio political um, piece. Yeah, I'm not suggesting it's it's depicting a real event, but it's a ceremonial piece. Mm. Um, so it, it is that clearly the bovine is incredibly important, and it does seem to be a, a representation of like um, I suppose terrestrial life. And the hawk is uh, is in the domain of the air and the heavens. And so, is there something about the union of those two forms coming together? When we see bat, there there are often uh, de depictions of stars associated with her. There's a beautiful palette in Cairo. It's only about this big. Uh, but we, we have the image of the, the cow horns and then we have the, have the stars. So she's clearly also seen as this celestial goddess. Yeah. I guess uh, Sopta as well in her cow form has the star between her horns. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Joe, I will let you go on now and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Just thank you so much. I think we've, we've done all of our questions now. That was really brilliant. Okay. And, um, I've thank recorded you. It. it was great. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was so incredibly interesting. I've recorded it and I'm going to put it up on my YouTube channel. So if any of you want to check it out again, you can. And please do share it. And hopefully I'll see you again at another Explorers Club. Yeah, definitely. OK, folks, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much, Joe. See you later, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.